Happy Easter to everybody. Yeah, it's good to have you here this morning. If you are visiting with us this morning, I want to invite you. There's a, there is a blue card in front of you. It says visitors on it. I would invite you to uh, fill out your information and leave that. You can leave that in your chair or you can bring it up and put it in the offering plate when you leave. But there's a box on there for you to, if you would like to be on our email list, you can be there uh, get on that as well. So uh, I invite you to do that. We would love to know that you were here this morning, and uh, it's you know it's okay. I pro- we promise you we're not going to stalk you or anything. But uh, if we don't know you're you're here and who you are, then there's we have no way to reach out and to, to love love you and to pull you into our into our fellowship. So that's uh, just offer that to you. Also uh, on your on your seats this morning. Uh, you saw a little cross. I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, we kind of, because of volume, we, I didn't, didn't order enough, and there's, uh, we've got some, you probably have a wooden cross. You may have a stone, a little red stone cross. Uh, if you would rather have the wood cross and you got the stone cross, you can let me know that and I'll get you one. But anyway, I've, I'll tell you more about those crosses in, in a little while. There's also, on the, if you, as you leave today on either one of the exit tables, there's a book that if you are newer in the faith and have some questions about the faith, uh, that book, we invite you to take that as our gift. Uh, if you would turn to Matthew 28, turn to Matthew 28. Now, before we read this, Matthew 28, you know, um, have you noticed that the last few years that, uh, that the Christian movies and productions are getting better? Have you noticed that? Used to, I think they find somebody walking down the street going, hey, you want to be in a movie? Come over here, we're going to do a Christian movie. But now they've actually got real actors and, you know, real cameras. It's really cool. They're, they're having... so, this, the, so I wanted to kind of set this scripture up today that we're going to read, Matthew 28. So I, I found a real slick production that, that had been done actually on this scripture. So I want, to, I want to offer that to you as we get started. Go ahead. Hey guys, 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 what? Okay, so you know how Pilate told me to guard the tomb of that Jesus fellow that you guys just killed because he said he was the son of God? Yes. Yeah, so an angel just came down from heaven and there was an earthquake and it was like kapow and he rolled away the stone and he said that Jesus ain't dead no more. And? And I figured that you'd want to know that because it totally proves that Jesus is the son of God. Thank you for this information, young man. Please tell everyone that his disciples stole the body. What? Why would I do that? Well, if you go around telling people that Jesus rose from the dead, people are going to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Yes, and of course, that's preposterous. Clearly, you men have hardened your hearts and despised the gospel, but I will not. I will not deny what I saw. I will not flee from the truth to any and all who will listen. I will shout from the rooftops that the stone has been rolled away, that the tomb is empty, and that here's some money, and that those disciples stole Jesus' body when I wasn't looking. Yes, how soon we change our tune, huh? Here's some money. All right, we're going to, so that really wasn't, that was just for, for fun, this, by the way, that wasn't serious. Okay, 28, Matthew 28, Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, uh, 
but really it was telling the story of our scripture today. The chief priests and the Pharisees had ordered the tomb guarded because they had heard that Jesus uh, had been saying before he was killed that he was going to uh, he was going to rise again on the third day, so they wanted to protect the tomb. Have you ever, you ever seen, gone to the cemetery and seen anybody standing guard over a grave? That's what was happening. They were standing guard over the grave. Okay, we'll pick it up in verse 1 there. After the Sabbath, at dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, uh, women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Is it okay if I read that again? He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole, away, uh, stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promise of your Holy Spirit. We have, we have invited your Spirit to come and be with us this morning. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would speak in power and authority and in that same power that you would stir our hearts and change us in Jesus name amen when I was a little boy I was about five or so and had me had me a new bike you know and uh, some of the young folks made a banana seat you remember the banana seat <laughs> yeah yeah and banana seat in the old school way somebody was telling me this morning that after the early services you could you remember you could close pin some, some cards in your spokes, you know, kind of thing. Well, I, being a young boy, I needed more power than that. That just wasn't getting her done. Well, Mom and Dad, I can't believe that y'all could even afford this. They got me a Varoom motor. Who, is in the, who in the church has had a Varoom motor? Jimbo? Yeah. Who else? There it is. In all its glory. Who else had a Varoom motor? Are you serious? Me and Jim? We had us some fun, didn't we, buddy? <laughs> this thing was awesome. You mounted it to your, the front of your bike, and see that lever there on the right? And you had the three switches, three settings on the left. You had the motor, and then you had, what does it say, idle, and then horn. Now, the, the motor, when you, when you put it in motor setting, and you rank, yank on that cable, it, That sounded just like it, didn't it, Jim? <laughs> I mean, you were bad to the bone with that thing. I mean, riding around the neighborhood with that. And if you put it, you set it up on horn, it was a siren. Oh, I mean, it was, man, you were the envy of the neighborhood with one of these things. The Varoom motor. Even as a little boy, I had me a passion for power. I, I wanted power. And I was telling Cheryl, I was trying to decide between these two, two stories, but the other, the other story... Uh, Mom, you keep learning things about me over the years. I'm 54 years old, and I think it's the first time she's heard this story. The little wall plugs that we have in our, in our house, one day when Mom and Dad were gone, I just, I mean, that just like a moth to the flame, baby. I wanted to see what would happen. I got me a paper clip, and I made it into a U shape. And I thought, I wonder what that thing will do if I stick that in that light cycle. <laughs> and so if you have little boys, watch them, okay? <laughs> Watch them, because 
it kind of poof, you know, and it, it blackened the little plate, and I'm scrubbing with 409, and, and, it, and it broke, the, it's through the breaker, which I thought, you know, I destroyed, you know, the city power plant or something. I didn't know what that was, but I got it pretty cleaned up, and when they got home, it's like, why aren't these lights for I don't know. I have no idea. But I had, this, I had this desire for power from a very young age. And I realized that, that even though that Varun motor was cool, I realized after I started getting a little bit older, I realized it was just noise. There really wasn't any power. It wasn't making me go any faster. There was nothing happening there. It was just noise. Hello. Christ would have us live a life of power. I'm starting a sermon series today uh, called Living a Resurrected Life. The, and we're going to talk for the sev next several weeks the, the attributes that, that come from the empty tomb that we have, have been able to take advantage of due to that the, that the tomb was empty, that it really was empty. And today's message is a life of power. And I realize that, that power isn't the sound produced, but it's rather the purpose it fulfills. The purpose it fulfills. Now, I want to, the ultimate example we have, every time we look at, at how to live our lives, we've got to start with Jesus. I mean, Jesus is, is where, where we really see the perfect life uh, filled with power lived out. Now, I'm going to hit this pretty quickly. I've given you some, some references to these scriptures in your notes, and you can look them up later. But basically, we understand from scripture that Jesus was conceived in the power of the Holy Spirit. It was the the Holy Spirit that, that came upon Mary and that and, and she conceived the child Jesus. So we know that from that that, that uh, Jesus was himself God, yet he was also flesh. Uh, we know that Jesus received the Holy Spirit at baptism. In Luke chapter 3, we, we see that the, paint the scene of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. And the Spirit of God came down in the form of dove, a dove and lit on, upon Jesus and the voice from the Father came and, and was uh, basically exalting the Son and saying, this is my Son, whom I will please. And so that's that picture of the Trinity happening all right there at the same time. Jesus, God, God, the, God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit is all be taking place there. So Jesus received the Holy Spirit at his baptism. He was immediately empowered to, uh, to, to, to go and, and do his ministry, to, to walk out his ministry. He was directed by the Spirit uh, to go into the desert, and he did battle with, with the uh, devil for 40 days, and then he came down. It says he came down in Luke chapter 4 that he was, came down in the power of the Spirit, and he began to do miraculous things. He began to walk on water, and he began to raise the dead, and he began to, to heal the lame and to heal the lepers and to restore sight to the blind, and on and on and on through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I want us to take just a second longer on a couple of, a couple of points here. Jesus, so he was not only conceived by the Spirit, received the Spirit for his ministry and empowered to uh, and directed to carry out his ministry, but he was empowered by the Spirit to endure the cross. Did you know that, that it was the power through the power of the Spirit that Jesus endured the cross? Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, and we, we sang of the blood of Christ this morning, what are we talking about when we talk about the blood of Christ? We're the shedding of his blood on the cross. It was through the blood of Christ that through the eternal spirit he offered himself unblemished to God. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God on the cross on our behalf. So, so we know that uh, Jesus was empowered to endure the cross by the power of the Spirit. And then Jesus was resurrected by the power of the Spirit. So uh, stay with me here now. It, it says in 2 Corinthians, Jesus uh, was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we live with him to serve him. Um, so we, and there's several scriptures. I, I could have, I would have, had to get several pages to, to include them all where it, it speaks of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit was resurrected. It was the Holy Spirit's power that brought life back into Jesus' body. Now here's the cool part. Here's the cool part. If we are in Christ, the same spirit of power that resurrected Jesus from the dead, here we go, listen, 
lives in us. Let that soak in just a second. The resurrection power that raised a lifeless Jesus to life and the tomb was empty because of that lives in you and me. If you're in Christ, how do we know that? Well, first of all, I know it from my own experience. I I know it because the Spirit empowered me in so many different ways when he came into me. But listen listen to what Jesus said about it. He says before he before he's uh, Uh, ascends to heaven he says it is for your good that I'm going away now now think about that the disciples are sitting here with Jesus and they're so excited because Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's telling them he's going away again and 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 can you imagine how they feel when he says it's for your good that I'm going away what's that all about no, it's not good. We want you here. We want you with us. But listen to what he says. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, speaking of the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Luke 24 says that, that Jesus promised, he says, you will be clothed with power from on high. There it is again, power, resurrection power. We're clothed in it. And he lives inside of us. Is is anybody else excited about that besides me? If you believe it, you've got to be excited about that. The creator of the universe, the same God who flung the stars in the sky, who took a light. I I don't know about you. I've never seen anybody that was dead and came back to life. Have you? I have read things where I I do believe that people are resurrected today even. Uh, That's you can believe it or not believe it, but there's documented facts of that. But I've never seen it. But these disciples saw a dead, lifeless Jesus coming down off of the cross and placed in the tomb. And on the third day, the tomb was empty. And they began to see him in the public places. He began to teach them. He began to fix breakfast for them. He began to uh, be, appear to over 500 people. The same power of the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead Because of that, we have the power to, number one, face pain and uncertainty with faith. Face pain and uncertainty with faith. The very first thing Jesus said as as he appears to, to the disciples and to the ladies there, he says, don't be afraid. Verse 10, don't be afraid. Can you imagine? They were probably scared to death. His first words, don't be afraid. But in this world, Jesus tells us, you know, a lot of people think, I, I don't, I've made peace, I've made peace with the fact, with this. We're going to have stuff happen in this world to us. If, if you hadn't made peace with that, you're in for a long, bumpy ride. I, I, don't, I don't get it when, I mean, I, I understand we struggle, but, but when I hear people, you know, it's like, this tragedy happened or whatever and people mad at God and, and it's like, I mean, I get it and sometimes that, that anger is a form of grief and certainly not trying to shame you for that. I'm just saying that, that man, we're surprised, really? When, when we lost my brother, uh, I told people it's like bad, you know, uh, and not belittling it. It was, it was an awful time for our family to go through that and to walk through that journey. But I'm like, bad, thing hap- bad things happen to people every day. Why not my family? Are we excluded from that somehow because Christ lives in us? I mean, no, bad things happen to people every day. There's tragic car wrecks and there's cancer and there's hurting marriages. I, I, Cheryl and I, t- we talk a lot with and try to help couples and in marriage and stuff. And the last month, the marriages have just been coming to me like crazy, struggling, hurting marriages and what that means is not just hurting marriages hurting people we're hurt, we're hurting we all we have we lose jobs prodigal children that are not behaving in a way that we would like for them to not being responsible and on and on and on there's just so many things jesus said in this life you will have trouble but i've overcome the world i want you to have peace and i want you to have abundant life um, 
Y'all, y'all know Rick Warren, know of Rick Warren, the pastor of uh, Saddleback Church in, in uh, California, and he uh, wrote the Purpose Driven Life, um, probably one of the most well-known pastors in, in the world, if not for sure the country. But um, uh, back in 2013, I was reading about it. Sometimes I'll listen to a sermon of Pastor Warren's or something, and um, I was doing some, some listening to some of his stuff, and I kind of ran across this Easter 2013, so two years ago. He preaches an Easter sermon, and they, golly, I mean, I'm preaching two this morning, and uh, I'm going to go home and collapse. I can't imagine, but he preaches like eight or ten or something in a weekend. And um, uh, so he preaches an Easter sermon on in 2013. Five days later, his son commits suicide. You better know the Easter message when you face stuff like that. His son had struggled with mental illness his whole life and, and uh, was a good, good young man, but just struggled, struggled with depression and all sorts of things. And uh, five days after Easter, he commits suicide. And, and, I'm, and, and I'm just thinking, wow, how do you get back in the pulpit after that? Well, you get back in the pulpit after that because how do you get up for another day after that? Because Christ never promised us that this life was easy. Tragic things happen. But because we have the power of the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead living inside of us, because of that, we have the power to face pain and uncertainty with faith. Whatever comes your way, if you have the, the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you have the power to get through it, to walk, to walk through it. I'm, and I'm seeing some people, and they know, they know who they are in this church who've had tragedy. And I've seen you walk, walk it in faith, and I'm proud to be your pastor. Jesus, one of my favorite scriptures, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and burdened. That's the Jesus. We don't have this Jesus that, that scolds us and points at us and tells us where we fail him. We have this this. Savior that opens his arm and says, come to me. If you're weary and you're burdened, I want to give you rest. I'm sending my spirit to live inside of you so that you'll get through the trials of life. Second thing, by the same power of the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, we have the power to live life with great joy and purpose. You ever been around a, a freeze-dried Christian? Freeze-dried Christian joy sucker. I've told you that. You, I've told you that little phrase before. I mean, just that I'm a Christian. They walk into a room and the joy just goes. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't. You can't find a piece of joy in any little crack in the corner when those folks walk in. That's not what attracts people to Christ. Man, and I know we all have our days, and I have my days, but if, if I'm walking around like that on a consistent basis, will somebody throw a rock up inside my head, please? Put me out of my misery. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> all right. And you're a little eager with that rock over there. <laughs> he who has no sin casts the first stone, I might say. Oh, man, that was good. Bada bean. I love it. Man, Jesus, if we don't have reason as Christians to be joyful, who does? Even in those trials of life that come, and these women, what was the first thing that happened? These women that, that Jesus appeared to in verse, in verse 8 here says, they were afraid, yet filled with great joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. They were on mission. That was the first missional outreach right there. They, they were filled with joy because they had experienced the risen Christ. Have you experienced the risen Christ? Yes. You ought to be filled with great joy, and you ought to have a purpose to share that. That was the very first thing. they Filled with great joy, they ran to tell. Jesus, at, before he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, he says, you will receive, here it is, power 
You will receive power. Say that word with me. Power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you will be my witnesses. We are filled with great joy because the Holy Spirit is in us. We're filled with great power. And we go and tell someone. That's how I end every Sunday. Yes? Go tell somebody. We, we are not a church that just absorbs. We're not people that just absorbs the goodness of Christ. No, he said, go tell what, what I have done for you. We have the power to live life with great joy and purpose. Third, third and lastly, by the same power of the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, we have the power to anticipate eternity with peace and confidence. Now, I say, I know there's going to come a day, and hopefully it'll be years from now after I've seen my grandkids that are yet to arrive. I'm You know, most, most children just have to endure that, you know, like at the house. they got to endure, endure it from the pulpit. <laughs> yeah, I would show you some pictures of my grandkids, but, oh, I don't have any. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Take your time, really. <laughs> All right. So, where, where was I going with all that? <laughs> I, I had a thought. Somewhere. Okay. And we have the power to, yeah, eternity. Yeah, that's where it's going to be till my kids talk to me again, eternity. We have the power to anticipate eternity with peace and confidence. Now, um, you know, I, I, well, I know where I was going. I hope that it's years from now when I'm tested with this. But, uh, you know, I, the Lord, he knows what he's doing, and I trust him whenever that is. But I've said before, and I, and I, and I believe this with all my heart. I'm just not afraid to die. It's not because I'm a good guy. It's not because I've served the Lord. It's not any of those things. It's not because of what I've done. In fact, it's in spite of the things I've done. It's because of what he's done for me. You understand? About uh, several years ago, I was in the hospital, and there was a man, and he had really, really bad cancer and, and uh, was coming towards the end of his life. And, and he knew that, and I knew that, <clears throat> and, and I was meeting with him, and he, I could just see it written all over his face. He was, he'd been in church all of his life. I could see it. He was scared to death. I mean, he was scared to death. And, and I think the Lord gave us about a 20-minute window there where, you know, the nurses weren't coming and zigging and zagging through the room, and I said, and I just looked at him, and I said, you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he kind of, you know, put that happy face on, and I said, are you afraid? And big tears welled up in his eyes, and he said, yes, I am. I said, are you afraid of dying? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, well, you know, um, we're all going to die. None of us getting out of here alive. I may, I may go before you. But I said, if I, when I go and I'm standing before my maker, do you know what I'm going to tell him? And he said, what's that? And I said, I'm not going to tell him about anything. You know, boy, man, didn't we work at the food pantry and, you know, our, our, his hands, we're going over and working on these folks' house Wednesday. I'm not going to tell him any of those kinds of things. What I'm going to say is, I think that my name's in your book. Check, that, check the Lamb's Book of Life. I, my name's in it. I understand what Christ has done for me. I understand that I'm a wretched man saved by grace through Jesus Christ. And I have the power of the Holy Spirit living in, in me. And I can face eternity with peace and confidence. Now, that's not bragging. I'm just telling you. Um, I just have a peace. Whatever, whatever the future brings. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. I just have a peace. When, uh, when we lost Jay a few years ago, I, you've heard me, if you've been here, you've heard me tell this story. But we were, we were in Lubbock at the Burn Center and... And we had, we had been told Jay was not going to make it. And so we were just there being together, grieving, waiting on the inevitable. And one of the nurses said just that you guys have blessed us. And I can tell you all know the Lord. And I was like, what, what's up with that? I mean, how do you know that? And she said, I see death every day. I work in the burn unit. We have traumatic injuries every day. And I see it. People come here. And the family either has peace 
or panicked. I want with all my heart for you to have peace. Jesus wants with all of his heart for you to have peace. He has purchased your eternity. And by the way, I said this last week, our eternity starts today. It doesn't start someday when we die, but it's, he wants us to have peace today as we look to the future. Um, there's a, I told you there's a cross, and now most of y'all got a wood cross. If you didn't see me, and if you'd like one, I think there's some extras, some of these chairs, but that, um, I like to, Easter, I like to have put something in people's hands. Just remember, it's a special day, and I just like to, we try to do a little something every year. And I was trying to think what would be good, and I and, uh, remembered that um, we, we went to, several of us went to the Holy Lands uh, about five years ago. And I was thinking, man, I wish I could, I wish I'd have bought even some, some of the little olive wood crosses that they had in the Holy Land. And I thought, I wonder if somebody like, imports those things in and can sell them. So I got on the internet and I found these. And so these, that cross that you have, if you have a wooden cross, it's, um, it comes from olive wood in the Holy Land. And I ordered those and got those in. And, um, and um, about, the, I guess it's the next day after I made that order, Cheryl and I went to see the movie, um, Do You Believe? Anybody seen the movie? A few of you? It's a good movie. Good movie. It's one of those Christian movies that is being well done, well produced. And, uh, but, but in this movie, the, the, there was a pastor in a big city, and he's driving down this road one night, and he sees this man, and he's got this big cross, and it's got a little roller on the bottom of it, and he's dragging this cross around the city, and, and the pastor pulls up beside him and says, what's, what's the deal with the cross? And he said, do you, do you believe in the cross? And the pastor said, I love this answer from the pastor, I'm a pastor. And he said, that's not what I asked you. <laughs> Did you know pastors can be lost too? And no, we're not going to take a vote on yours. <laughs> but he said, I didn't ask you if you were a pastor. I asked you, do you believe? And, and, he's, and he said, yes, I do. I believe in the cross and the power of the cross. And that next Sunday, that pastor bought little wooden crosses and had them sitting on every chair. And I told I leaned over to Cheryl and I said, I just ordered some wooden crosses yesterday to put at each chair on Easter Sunday before we saw that movie. And I, and I think God's maybe trying to tell us something, the power of that cross. Listen to this passage. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, here's his word, it's the power of God. There's, if I can find mine, there's power in the cross. There's power in the empty tomb. Now I want you to notice that there's, there's one thing that the cross and the empty tomb have in common. They are empty. Jesus didn't own the cross anymore. When he, his last thing he said was, it is finished. He accomplished what he set out to accomplish on this cross. They took him down. They put the dead, lifeless body in the tomb. Three days later, the tomb was empty. They're both empty. Sin couldn't keep Jesus on the cross, and death couldn't keep him in the tomb. Here's what I want you to do with this cross. Um, you can keep it. You can, do, you can do whatever you want to with it, but you can keep it. Or I, I want you to pray over this cross and what you should do with it, but in the movie, and I won't spoil it, I won't spoil the movie for you or anything, but, but several different people did different things with their cross. They would m maybe give it the cross to someone that they felt like needed the cross or whatever, and all sorts of things began to happen as following these crosses around the city. And um, do you know the power of the cross? Is it foolishness or is it power to you? Um, I want to ask you if you'd just bow your heads with me. You know, Jesus, um, we thank you. I, I don't know, Lord, I just thank you, first of all, for just the ability to laugh and, and, and enjoy your presence, fellowship with one another, being with your people. 
I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead and now lives in us. May, may that power, that spirit manifest itself in us. May it, may it multiply and it, it just ooze out of us. Show us how to be like you. Thank you for the empty cross and the empty tomb. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Hatcher with Wiley Methodist Church in Abilene, Texas. I want to thank you for listening to this message from God's Word today. I want to remind you that you have a Savior named Jesus Christ, and He loves you. He proved His love by hanging on a cross in your place. His desire for you is abundant life. If you have never received Him as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you to do that right now right where you're at. Just say something like this to him. Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that sin has separated me from you. I repent of my sin. I ask you to come into my heart to cleanse me and make me a new creation. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time today, I need you to do four things. Tell a member of the clergy about your decision to follow Jesus. Number two, get baptized. Jesus himself set us the example for this. Number three, open your Bible and begin to read it. A good place to start is the Gospel of John. Number four, begin attending a Bible teaching church. If you have any questions, you can contact me at jhatcher at wileymethodist.org. I'll be happy to come along your side as you, as you start this new beginning with Jesus Christ. God bless you.